Today we finish up our series on transformed. And if you have your Bible, we'll be in Ezekiel chapter 36 this morning. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26 is where we'll read. When I went to college, I uh, was down in a college town. Springfield, Missouri has several different colleges, several Bible colleges in uh, Southwest Missouri State. I think it's called Missouri State now, but it was down there. And so, you know, you're in college town. That means there's abundance of jobs. And when there's an abundance of jobs, you know what that means? They don't want to pay you hardly anything. So it was minimum wage. And I'm there and I'm having to work to go to college. And I'm trying to figure out where I want to work at. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't want to work at McDonald's. I didn't want to do the fast food guy. I'd already done the grocery store job because I've told you about that. So also in spring from Missouri at that time was the telemarketing center for MCI. Now, if you've been around for a while, you know what MCI is. These young people have no idea what MCI was. But back in the day, when there used to be such a thing as long distance wars and everybody didn't have a cell phone, you had to pay for every minute of long distance. So right now, you guys are like, yes, I can call anybody around the country, and it's included my plan. Back in the day, you guys remember this, it was like 10 cents a minute, 12 cents a minute. And so I ended up getting a job at MCI, and I'm calling people, and I'm the person that aggravated you back in the 90s that said, hi, would you like to change your long distance company? So before you hate me, the reason I did that is because MCI paid better wages than anybody else. You got your weekends off and you actually had kind of a set schedule. So it was really nice. Now, MCI was doing really great. We were the number two long distance carrier in the country. We were selling this stuff right and left because we were telemarketing. And I remember what they said. They said, if you are going to be professional, their mindset was you are going to look professional. And you're not going to believe this, but we never saw anybody. We're sitting in little cubicles. And when we went to work, I wore a tie every single day, not because I wanted to, but because I had to. Last week, somebody saw me outside and they said, hey, you don't have a tie on. And I said, no, and we're there on Sunday morning, all right? So this is not my normal garb. But I would wear a tie every day to MCI, and I would sit in that little cubicle, and the women they had to wear dress professional as well. And they said the reason why they wanted us to do that is because if they thought we looked professional, we would act professional. And that sounds pretty good, but I want to tell you something. When people get on that phone and start trying to sell out long distance, of course, we had these specials. They still have specials today. You call somebody up and they say, oh, for a little limited time. When you hear that limited time, you know it's only it's going to be so long, right? For a limited time, we can give you this. And I remember our spiel was basically for the first month, we're going to give you half off your rates. So normally you're going to pay 10 cents. We're going to give you five cents. And we had our nice clothes on. And I remember people being there at MCI and they would change that spiel up a little bit and say, we are giving you half off and it's 10 cents and there's another half off. And what the way they would make it sound is they were getting their long distance for two and a half cents a minute. And they would sell all kinds of people like that. And you know, it's amazing. They did all that lying with ties on. They did all that lying, dressed professionally. And what I realized is this. No matter how good they looked on the outside, the problem when they were lying, their problem when they were cheating, their problem when they were doing all this stuff wasn't an outward problem. It was an inward problem. And oftentimes we don't realize that if we're really going to change who we are, if we're going to be transformed like we've been talking about, the transformation isn't going to happen from the outside. The transformation is going to happen from the inside and it's going to work its way out. We got all kinds of people today that think, well, if I transform the outside, then I'll be all right. If I look healthy, then I am healthy. Listen, you can go get a suntan all you want to. If you're not healthy, you're not healthy, right? You put a little color on your cheek, you can put makeup on yourself, but if you're not healthy, you're not healthy. And so when we look at ourselves spiritually this morning and we say, okay, God, I want a healthy heart. That means I've got to transform something right here. And when I transfer something right here, it's going to come out on the outside and it's going to show up. So when we look at this, I'm reminded of verse of 1 Samuel 16, 7, before we get to our passage. And this is what the Bible says. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, look not on his countenance or the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. 
If you want to know me, you want to see my heart. If you want to see what matters, if you want to see where I place my effort, my time, my affection, you're going to want to know my heart because that's where you're going to find that out. So here it is this morning. How can I transform my heart? Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. This is what it says. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Two simple verses of scripture this morning, but what can we find in this that's going to transform our heart, that's going to change the way we look? I think the first thing we're finding here today is God does not just want to change what's in there. He wants to exchange He wants you to exchange your heart. Verse 26 says, a new heart, a new heart also I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart. I will take away that stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. First of all, it's God's goal today to exchange this old hard heart that we have with something that's loving, something that's tender, something that's real. It's very easy for us over time to get hard-hearted on things, isn't it? You go out, and you may have the best intentions. You come across some old grouch, and guess what? Your heart gets a little bit more hard, don't it? I'll be driving to my car, and I'll let somebody out, and they won't wave and say thank you, and I get mad. Why are they saying thank you? I just let them out. And the next person comes up, they want in, and guess what? I'm not letting them in. (laughs) We can get hard-hearted fast, can't we? We can get hard-hearted about people. We can say, well, look at them, those young people. We can classify every young person together. We can say, look at those old people. We can classify all old people together. Or we can say, look at those people from that state of Ohio or that state of this or that state of that. And we can get very hard-hearted to where we're not worrying about individuals and we're not seeing people's needs, but we're just saying, here's what everybody's like. We need to care about people the way God cares about us. And that's on a personal level. When we really look at the life of Jesus Christ, what we find is we find that he's meeting needs of people individual. He went and talked to the woman at the well. He talked to the man who was possessed with demons. He was healing people and talking to people like Nicodemus and like Martha and Mary and Lazarus. We find that these are the people that he made the greatest impact on because he took the time. And when we have the right kind of heart, it's going to make us take the time to get to know people and get to love people and get to care for people. His promise here then is to give us a new heart. We may look and say, well, maybe that person uh, has a good heart already, pastor. They're very kind. They're very considerate. But I want to tell you something. Until you get saved, you don't have that new heart. You don't have a different heart. There's people that say, well, they're tenderhearted. And maybe you've seen them. They're tender towards people. They love people. And I've met a lot of people in my life that are physically tenderhearted. They see a need and they want to meet that need. Sometimes they're not saved and they want to meet physical needs. But if you're going to be spiritually tenderhearted, you have to know Jesus. If you're going to be spiritually tenderhearted to where you care about what other people are doing, you have to know Jesus. See, even the most tender heart physically, if they don't know Jesus, is needing a heart change. If they don't know Jesus, they're missing out on something spiritually. They're missing out on something that's important. Spurgeon said this. He said, the enlightenment of the understanding only enables him to sin with a greater weight of responsibility. Resting upon him, he knows good to be good, but he prefers the evil. He sees the light, but he loves the darkness. And he turns from the truth because his heart is alienated from God. If you don't have the Lord and your Savior, if you haven't had that change, that exchange of that heart, guess what? No matter what you're doing, it's not doing any good spiritually for you. I can give you something to eat. I can meet your need close. But what about eternity? Where does that play into it? What about the needs of those people that's sitting out here? We have a bunch of people today in this world that they say, I'm going to do the best I can, pastor. And the Bible says the best we have is like filthy rags to the Lord. That means I have to have an exchange of my heart. 
I have to change and exchange what's there right now because no matter how tenderhearted I want to be towards everyone out here, no matter how much I want to love on you and hug on you and shake your head and smile, if I don't know Christ as my Savior, there's something still missing spiritually. There's something that I don't have. And God says, right now, your heart is hard towards me. You don't know me. You don't have that relationship with me. You haven't personally experienced my love and my hope and my peace. He wants to give us that today. He wants to take that away, what's there that's hard, and he wants to soften and change it. And to our heart is changed. Our head just tells us what we're doing isn't right, that what we're doing is missing something, that there's a point that's not there. The heart and the spirit, they go together. And if you read right here, it says the Lord not only wants to exchange our heart, but he also wants to exchange our spirit. He wants to give us a different spirit than what we have right now. The heart and the spirit, they go together because if you have a proud spirit, your heart's probably also going to be proud. If you have a spirit of revenge, then your heart's going to be looking for revenge and vengeance. Oh, Christian, it's easy sometimes to get a hard heart. Even when we're saved, we can let our heart get hard again, and we can start having that kind of attitude where we don't see people's needs, where we see our ways of getting ahead and getting even. That's a dangerous way to look at things, isn't it? We look at our world today, and I think maybe that's part of the problem is we have a bunch of hard-hearted people. When we get our heart hard, we don't care about anybody else. We don't care about what's going on around us. We don't care about the people that's suffering. Because all we're worried about is me and what I need and what I get. Out there today, how many people are going through loss? How many people are going through struggles? How many people are looking for hope? Hard-hearted people don't pay attention to that. Soft-hearted people notice it. Soft-hearted people that know Christ and know his saving grace recognize that everybody's not okay out there. And they're willing to love on them and they're willing to hug on them, but they're also willing to pray with them and pray for them. And church, we need to have that attitude of prayer. We need to have that attitude of care. We need to want to take care of people's needs and meet them. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This is new. It's a change in the way we act. It's a change in what we do. It's a change in the way I see things, the way I see people, the way I see needs. It's a change in what I can do for those people, for those things, and for those needs. People always say, what would Jesus do? And yet without the heart of Jesus, you'll never know. You ever think about that? What would Jesus do? How would he respond? I see people all the time. Well, if you were like Jesus, you would do this. But it's people talking that don't know Jesus. How they possibly can say what Jesus would do if they don't know him, is in, it's, it's crazy. You have to know him to know what he's going to do. You may think I read about it in a book, but there's a difference in reading about Jesus in a book and having a relationship with Jesus. You read about George Washington, but you don't really know George Washington. There is a story I heard of George Washington. I do not know if it's true. I will share it with you right now. <laughs> a little boy one day was out and he was having a big time, and it was back in the olden days when they had owl houses, and he was very happy because he was just playing, and all of a sudden he saw that owl house, and he had a mean spirit about him. Maybe he had a hard heart, I don't know. But he said, I always wanted to push that owl house over, so what did he do that day? He pushed that owl house over. When he got home, his dad was waiting for him, and his dad said to him, son, I noticed the owl house is pushed over. Did you push that owl house over? The little boy thought for a moment, and he said, Dad, yes, I did. His dad whipped him. And the little boy said, I'm a little confused, Dad. I read in the story of George Washington how that when he was a little boy, he cut down the cherry tree. And when he cut down the cherry tree and his dad asked him, he said he did, and he did not get in trouble. And the dad said, well, son, George Washington's dad wasn't in that cherry tree when he cut it down. <laughs> 
Now, I do not know if that is a true story about George Washington or not, but... We have a different spirit. Everything about us today isn't just physical stuff. We want to look at the spiritual side and we think if we're physically doing this, then we're right. If we have a tie on, if we look the best, if we are sharp. And I'm going to tell you something. You can look on the news and you can see these people that are getting accused of all kinds of terrible crimes. And most of the time they don't look too bad. Because the outside isn't the problem. The inside's the problem. You may be the best looking person in here today on the outside. But my question this morning is, how are you doing on the inside? How's your heart with the Lord? Because it's not your heart with me and it's not your heart with these folks out here. We can be tenderhearted to one another and we can miss knowing Jesus. So if we know him, we're going to get an exchanged heart with him. That's not all he's given us today, though. He's also promised us he will indwell your body. Verse 27 says, and I will put my spirit within you. It's another thing that happens with that exchange. He you know, he takes out the old heart, but he puts in his spirit. And when we talk about his spirit, we know what he's talking about. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Don't be confused today and think that one day when you have some kind of great thing that happens and maybe you can do some great wonder, that that's when you get the spirit. My Bible says that when you got saved, you get that spirit. But you shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. You want to know if you got the Holy Spirit or not? If you're not telling anybody about Jesus, then that's your question right? I'm going to talk about him because I love him, because I believe in him, because he's powerful, because he can do something. We start talking about this great spirit that comes. Now am I going to get a new heart that's going to be not stony, but I'm going to get the spirit of God that's going to indwell on me and he's going to empower me and he's going to enable me. This morning, I'm not questioning if the spirit has me. I'm questioning about how much he has of me. I used to have this couple I'd visit in Cincinnati and they were an older couple and they didn't really leave their house very much. And I remember I'd go into their house and when I walked into the living room, they had plastic on all their furniture and nobody sat in there. And you'd go through their dining room, no one sat in there. You would go into their kitchen, except for the appliances, no one sat in there. Nobody used any of that stuff. And finally you would get to this little bitty bedroom and in that little bedroom, they'd put a couch and a chair, and they had the bed there. And that's where I guess they spent all their time at. They didn't use the basement. They didn't use any part of it. This whole big old house and one little compartment is all they had. One little room. You know, the moment we get saved, we tell the Holy Spirit, hey, you're welcome to my house, right? This is my body. Why? No, you're not your body. It's a temple of God. This is his temple. But you know what some of us do? We pretend like we're those folks and we say, Jesus, here is your room. It's the Sunday room. And on Sunday, this room is yours. You have full power. You have the ability to walk this room on Sunday. And this is where you're at. And that's great on Sunday. But guess what? On Monday, Jesus is still in the Sunday room and I'm on the Monday room. And then the Tuesday room, and Jesus is still in the Sunday room. And the Wednesday room, and Jesus is still in the Sunday room. And the Thursday, and the Friday, and the Saturday. And where is Jesus? He's still in the Sunday room. And then all of a sudden, I show back up on Sunday. He says, I sure have missed you this week. Well, Lord, you're living in me. Yes. But where have you been? I expected when I took residence to see you every day, not just once a week. Oftentimes, what we do is we give Jesus this little bitty room in our life, and we say, this is where you're at, Lord, and this is where you're staying. And we wonder, why am I not happy? Why has my heart not changed? Why don't I have the same things that I see all these other people have? It's because we haven't let the Lord have control of our life. We've given him a part. And that's why maybe when you're in church, that's your happiest day. Maybe Sunday is your favorite day of the week. Because, man, I really enjoy Sunday. I really enjoy getting with Christians. I really enjoy all this stuff. I don't understand why the rest of the week is rough for me. Well, listen, let Jesus out of Sunday and let him have the whole house and see what happens. Right, Christian? Let him have all the house, teenagers. Let him have it all the time. When you're at school, let him have it. On Monday, let him have it. On Tuesday, let him have it. 
Adults, let them have it at your workplace. Let them have it in your family life. Let them have it at home. Let them have it when you're going through the valleys. Let them have it when you're going through the trials. Let them have it when you're going through the best. Let them have it when you're at King's Island or Disney World or any place else, right? But let him have full reign and see what happens in your life. See what happens to your heart and what can change. See what happens when God can do what he wants to do, when he can use you like he wants to use you. It will change things for you. He wants to give us his spirit, but what we are doing is we're holding his spirit in a little box. And as long as he's in that little box, he's never going to be able to do the remodeling he wants to do. You've seen somebody before that had like one room remodel in their house and they stopped Say, why would you stop for? They'll give you all kinds of reasons. It's time consuming. Hey, guess what? If you're going to serve the Lord, it's going to take some time. It costs a great price to remodel. Well, if you're going to serve the Lord, it may cost you a little bit. The question you have to ask yourself is, is the end result worth it? You tell me in your own remodeling job, is it worth it? You walk into that new bathroom, that new kitchen, you say it's worth it. I'm going to tell you something. If you let the Lord remodel your life, you'll say it's worth it. You'll say it's worth it because it means something to you. Transformation is about how many rooms you're going to let him remodel. Transformation is going to be how many rooms you let him have access to. Because the rooms he accesses, he's going to probably remodel, folks. Finally, this morning, what happens when we let him have that place? He talks about creating a new path. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep them and keep my judgments and to do them. The new heart, the new spirit, and the dwelling of this spirit is supposed to transform my walk. We oftentimes think we can change our walk from the outside. We'll change our clothes. We'll change our words. We even start down a new path. But if the inside is the same, we are eventually going to head back down the path that we were at. If you don't have any plans on getting off that path, eventually you're going to go back because you're going to figure out how to get going the new way. If you don't have a new ideal and a new purpose, you're going to go back to what you knew. The reason why we're supposed to do this is this spirit that we give him access to us is supposed to guide us to a better path, to guide us to a better way because we need to believe today that Jesus' path is better than the path I have already set for myself. That where I end up with him is going to be better than where I end up without him. And we know that's true, amen? One of the greatest struggles people have when they get saved is leaving behind the old self. The Bible says you cannot serve two masters. But many times we get excited on a Sunday and by Wednesday, if we don't give the Lord complete control, we're discouraged again. Our excitement is quenched because we haven't given Jesus full access. So our path is back to the old path and not his path. Everything that's happening, if there's not a heart change, is just an outward sign. God's desire here is to transform us from the inside and cause us to go down the right path. But the Lord wants us to do something with a transformed heart. He wants us to put down the right path in front of us. The Lord hasn't saved you to do nothing today. And the Lord doesn't save you to continue as you're doing. The Lord saves us to walk with him, to follow him, to obey him. There's an old song that says, walk with me, walk with me, lest mine eyes no longer see all the glory, all the story of your love. Talk to me, talk to me as you spoke so tenderly as you walk there, as you talk there by the sea. And the chorus says, let me follow in the footsteps that trod the shores of Galilee and let me learn to pray as he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. So take my hand, take my hand 
Teach me, Lord, to understand all the beauty, all the duty of your love. Romans 12, 10, 12 2, our theme verse this year. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A real tr- transformation is going to change us completely. It's going to bring us back to God's original plan and bring me back to the best me I'm supposed to be. This morning, as we get ready to celebrate Valentine's Day, I thought it was fitting we talked about the heart. But here's the truth of this. This right here, these out here, all those things, if this doesn't change, we'll do nothing. You say, Pastor, I'm very tenderhearted to the needs of people around me. But you know what tenderhearted people also are sometimes? They're susceptible to making everybody happy around them. I have a tenderhearted son like no other. And my greatest fear is that he can be influenced by somebody else because he wants to please people and he wants them to be happy. And you know what happens if you're not spiritually tender? You're tender to everything else. Maybe this morning you're sitting here and you say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. That first change of the heart is right there to know him on a personal level. It's not how many times you come to church. It's not how good you are. It's not how much abilities you have. It's the basic question of this. If I were to die right now, if I were to die right now, am I 100% sure that I'd be on my way to heaven? Because if you don't know that, you can know it. Sometimes all you have to do is say, Lord, I want you. Maybe you're sitting here as a Christian today and your issue is the Lord's giving you an exchange tart, but what you've done is you've put the Lord in one little component of your house. And on Sunday, he is good and he is being talked to and he is being spent time with, but every other compartment in your house, he's not allowed in. And you're saying, I don't understand why I don't have the joy. I don't have the peace. I don't have this that everybody else has. And I want to ask you, is he able to remodel that part of your life? If he has, I don't want to invite you down here. You can pray with me. You can pray with one of our workers. Or you can pray by yourself and say, Lord, I'm giving you full control of my life. If you don't know him today as your Savior, though, would you come? You've heard this message so many times but there's no guarantee you're going to hear it next week because there's no guarantee you'll be here next week. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you that we can have a changed heart, that you exchange that old stony heart with a living, beating, loving heart. Lord, maybe there's one today that when it really boils down to it, they're doing everything they can humanly, but they don't know you as their Savior. They've never made that personal decision. Lord, I pray today that they walk this aisle and grab my hands and say, Pastor, please tell me how I can know for sure that I'm on my way to heaven. Your scripture said these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. That's your promise, Lord. Lord, I'm praying for Christians today that need to give the Lord more rooms in their house. Maybe it's a little bit better than just a Sunday room, but there's still things that are holding back. And there's a remodel that needs to take place. Lord, I pray for that person that needs to come today. Maybe there's others that need to come and say, I need to follow you in baptism. I've been hard to that. I need to join this church. I've been hard to that. Maybe they're saying, I just need to rededicate my life or I need to move my membership here. Lord, whatever it is that you're speaking to people today, let this be your invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us this morning? With love to you.